Okay, good afternoon and welcome to Marquette University Law School's annual Hallows Lecture. My name is Joseph Kearney and it is a great privilege for me as Dean of the Law School to introduce both the lecture and the speaker. I would like to begin with the individual whom we remember through this lecture. The Honorable E. Harold Hallows served as a member of the Wisconsin Supreme Court for 16 years, from 1958 to 1974, the last six of those years as the court's chief justice. This was a dynamic time in the law. Constitutional doctrine, criminal procedure, and tort law were among the areas that changed mightily in this decade and a half or so. Justice Hallows played a significant role in these developments on the Wisconsin front. Yet we remember him here as much for his previous service to the law. For some 28 years before his judicial service, Justice Hallows was Professor Hallows here at Marquette University Law School. A whole generation of students took courses such as Equity and Equity II from Professor Hallows. This was in addition to his work as a practicing lawyer. <laughs> for almost two decades now, the law school has held an annual Hallows Lecture in the late Chief Justice's memory. Today it is our great honor to welcome the Honorable Paul J. Watford, Judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Before taking the bench in 2012, Judge Watford was a partner at Margaret Tolls and Olson in Los Angeles and previously served as an Assistant United States Attorney in L.A. To judge from his resume, he ranges from his, from his native Southern California only for very good reasons. These have included, first, his college studies at the University of California, Berkeley, before I returned to Southern California and the University of California, Los Angeles for law school and a clerkship with Judge Alex Kaczynski. Second, a year in Washington, D.C., serving as a law clerk to Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg of the Supreme Court of the United States. And now, third, his visit to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. <laughs> in the midst of a March snowstorm to deliver Marquette Law School's Hallows Lecture. Please join me in welcoming to Eckstein Hall, the Honorable Paul Watford. Thank you very much. It is an honor to be here. Um, I can't thank Dean Kearney enough for inviting me to come. I have to say I, I didn't hesitate for a second when he extended the invitation, but that was many months ago, and if I had known it was going to be six degrees or something in Milwaukee, um, I might have at least thought about it a little bit. But, uh, but no, in all seriousness, it's really uh, an honor to be here, and I'm glad to see so many of you here. Uh, all right, so the subject of this lecture is a remarkable but a relatively obscure case called Screws versus United States. It was decided by the Supreme Court of the United States in 1945, and it's a case involving police brutality in which the victim was killed. The federal government uh, prosecuted the officers who were involved uh, after the state refused to do so. Now, I say the case is relatively obscure because it hasn't been totally forgotten. It, it does make a brief appearance in federal courts' case books, um, and it has received star billing in a smattering of law review articles over the years. But, uh, and I would say, I guess, that certainly former federal prosecutors, uh, uh, as, uh, like myself, and defense lawyers who uh, prosecute police brutality cases, um, they're certainly familiar with the case, but on the whole, um, it's, it's largely been forgotten. And my goal this afternoon is to make the case that, to, that Screws deserves greater attention and recognition than it has thus far received. I regard it as one of the most significant, or one of the more significant, civil rights cases that the Supreme Court has decided. There are several things that, this, that, makes the, uh, that make the Screws case remarkable in my view, and I'll touch on each of them during this lecture. First, the case is remarkable because of the shocking nature of the crime involved. The almost nonchalant manner in which the defendants carried out the crime provides a window into what life was like day in, on a day-in and day-out basis for African Americans in the South, uh, particularly from the end of the Civil War until the 1960s. The lack of personal security from violence at the hands of white citizens, whether police officers as in screws uh, or private individuals, was an ever-present reality. And the, and the events in Screws, I think, uh, as you'll hear, are a stark reminder of that fact. <clears throat> Second, the fact that the Screws case was prosecuted at all is remarkable. It took a unique confluence of factors to make that happen in 1943, 
And the history behind uh, uh, those uh, events leading up to screws is fascinating in and of itself. I, I won't have time to do anything more than scratch the surface of those events in this lecture, but I'll try to give at least some flav flavor of the rich historical narrative that lurks uh, beneath this case. And finally, the Screws case is remarkable for the legacy it has, le it has left, one that in my view is largely unappreciated. Had Screws come out the other way and been decided against the federal government, federal civil rights enforcement would have been stifled. Instead, it was given new life, and, ha and that helped change the course of history, particularly in the South in the second half of the 20th century. I'll return to these points toward the end of the lecture and try to flesh them out a bit more. <clears throat> and I'm going to apologize up front for my voice. I've been trying to fight off a, a bit of a head cold, so I'm going to have to uh, take some frequent sips of water here. Let me start by sketching out the basic facts of the Screws case. First off, who was Screws? Well, Screws was M. Claude Screws, sheriff of Baker County, Georgia. Baker County is a small county in southwest Georgia, viewed by some at the time as one of the most, one of the most backward counties in, uh, in the state. All of the action in the case occurred in a small town called Newton, which was the county seat. Newton had a population at the time of maybe 300 people, so definitely one of those small towns where everyone knows everyone. And sure enough, Sheriff Screws knew the victim in the case. He was a 30-year-old 30, a 30 African-American man named Robert Hall. And, uh, and Screws, in fact, knew Hall, uh, all of Hall's life. Screws described Hall as a bigoty Negro. Those are his words. Someone others within the local black community looked to as a leader of sorts. Now, at the time, in large areas of the South, that alone might have made Hall a target for violent attack, uh, either by local law enforcement groups, uh, either by local law enforcement, rather, or groups like the Ku Klux Klan intent on maintaining white supremacy. Targeting those who had the audacity to assert their rights, or even those who just seemed to have uh, prospered a little too much financially, uh, proved an effective tactic in reinforcing the proper place African Americans were supposed to occupy in society. Although it's used in a somewhat different sense, the old Japanese proverb, proverb comes to mind, the nail that sticks up gets hammered down. That was certainly true uh, back then. In any event, Hall didn't just attempt to assert his rights. He did so in a way that made things particularly personal for Screws. It all started when, at Screws' direction, uh, one of his deputies seized Hall's pearl-handled pistol. It's a, a nice pistol that, uh, that Mr. Hall prized. Screws had no apparent basis under Georgia law for his action, but he later stated his justification this way. If any of these damn Negroes think they can carry pistols, I am going to take them. Hall didn't take this apparent injustice lying down. He went to Screws' house and asked the sheriff to return his pistol. Screw said he would have to look into the matter and later told Hall's father that uh, Hall would need a court order to get his pistol back. Right, good luck with that. Undaunted, though, Hall appeared before the local grand jury and asked it to compel Hall to return the pistol. The grand jury lacked the power to do that, but it did call Screws to testify to explain his actions. That would have been bad enough, but Hall then retained a local attorney to help him get his pistol back. The attorney sent Screws a letter addressing the apparently wrongful seizure of the gun. The attorney's letter might have been the straw that broke the camel's back. Either the day that Screws received the letter or the following day, Screws told several Newton residents he was going to get Robert Hall. Screws began the evening of January 29, 1943, at a local bar, and you'll hear that that's the, the date that the crime occurred. Around midnight, he sent two officers to Hall's house to arrest him on charges of stealing a tire. All indications were that Screws had forged the arrest warrant, although that wasn't proved conclusively at trial. According to Hall's wife, the officers handcuffed him before they placed him in the patrol car. The officers then drove Hall to the town square in front of the courthouse uh, where Screws was waiting. The three men proceeded to beat Hall with their fists and a two-pound blackjack. They did so in plain sight and hearing of the many residents whose homes faced onto the town square. As, res as residents watched from their windows and porches or listened from their bedrooms, <clears throat> Screws and the other two officers took turns beating Hall after he had fallen to the ground and lay motionless. <clears throat> 
One resident testified, the lick sounded like car doors were slamming. The beating continued for roughly 30 minutes, during which screws could be heard commanding the other officers, hit him again, hit him again. When the officers were finished, they had crushed the back of Paul's skull, and they left a pool of blood three feet by four feet in the middle of the town square. Screws ordered the two officers to take Hall to the nearby jail. The officers dragged Hall by the legs up the sidewalk into the courthouse and around to the back where the jail was, uh, where they left him on the floor of a cell uh, where other inmates were. Screws eventually summoned an ambulance, but Hall died shortly after arriving at the hospital without ever regaining consciousness. <clears throat> In the morning, on their way to the market or the post office, the townsfolk of Newton uh, could still see the pool of blood sitting there uh, in the middle of the town square and the trail leading from that spot up to the courthouse and, uh, and on around to the jail. Now, after the state of Georgia refused to bring charges against Screws and his co-defendants, the federal government indicted the three men for depriving Hall of his federal constitutional rights, namely the right not to be deprived of his life without due process of law. The statute under which the officers were indicted makes it a federal crime to willfully deprive someone of any rights, privileges, or immunities secured or protected by the Constitution and laws of the United States while acting under color of any law, statute, ordinance, regulation, or custom. That statute had been on the books uh, with only minor changes since right after the Civil War. It's been codified in different places over the years, but it's now found at 18 U.S.C., Excuse me for one second. Uh, 18 U.S.C. Uh, section 242, and for ease of reference, I'll just refer to it throughout as uh, section 242. As I said, it's been given other uh, other names before. This is again my uh, the remnants of my cold, and I apologize. A jury in Albany, Georgia, convicted all three defendants of violating section 242. Uh, and they rejected, the jury rejected the officer's claim that the beating had been justified in self-defense. The Fifth Circuit affirmed the convictions in a two-to-one decision, and the Supreme Court granted the defendant's petition for certiorari and set the case for argument in October of 1944. Now, before explaining <clears throat> what the Supreme Court actually held when it decided the case uh, some months later in May 1945, I want to step back and provide a bit of historical context for the Screws prosecution. That's necessary in order to appreciate the stakes involved when the Supreme Court took up the Screws case, and it explains why the Screws case uh, wound up in the Supreme Court when it did. As I mentioned, Section 242 traces its roots <clears throat> back to Reconstruction right after the Civil War. At that time, the nation was in crisis. In the wake of the bloodiest war in American history, violence against African Americans in the South abounded as the Ku Klux Klan uh, flourished. A deeply divided Congress battled over the best means of solving this problem and reconciling the South with the Union. Now, we're all familiar with one of the products uh, of that era, and that's, of course, the great Reconstruction Era constitutional amendments. The 13th Amendment abolishing slavery, the 14th Amendment prohibiting states from denying anyone, among other, among other things, equal protection of the laws, and the 15th Amendment, prohibiting denial of the right to vote on the basis of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. What's less well known, though, is the comprehensive set of statutes that Congress enacted between 18, 1866 and 1875 to enforce the rights conferred by these amendments. Had all of those statutory provisions remained in, a, remained in effect and been vigorously enforced, <coughs> enforced, the stakes and screws wouldn't have been nearly as high. So I'm going to take a minute here to sketch out where 242 fits within this larger project, and then I'll explain why, by 1945, the fate of Section 242 proved so pivotal. Congress passed a series of statutes during Reconstruction that were designed mainly to protect the civil rights of, of the newly freed slaves, and I'll just give you a brief description of that, that larger body of work. Congress first focused on securing equal citizenship status and the fundamental rights necessary to a free existence. The Civil Rights Act of 1866, that was the very first of these statutes that was passed, <clears throat> declared that all persons born in the United States are citizens of the United States and, as such, are entitled to enjoy the same basic rights as white citizens. Those rights included the right to make and enforce contracts, the right to sue, 
the right to give evidence in court, and the right to purchase and hold property. Although much of this legislation was superseded two years later with the ratification of the 14th Amendment, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 remains significant because that's the statute where Section 242 originated. Congress next turned to securing the right to vote using its powers under the newly ratified 15th uh, Amendment, which was ratified in 1870. Congress passed statutes governing just about every aspect of the electoral franchise, from registration to voting qualifications to counting of the ballots. It also established an elaborate scheme of, elect of election observers to be administered by the federal circuit courts. And in addition, to combat the unprecedented wave of racially motivated violence that swept through much of the South during Reconstruction, Congress passed a complex set of criminal statutes, criminal enforcement statutes, rather. Those statutes went so far as to grant the president authority to, sus to suspend the writ of habeas corpus in lawless areas of the South where the Ku Klux Klan uh, reigned with or without state complicity. And finally, Congress, passed, uh, Congress sought to secure equal rights in everyday public life. And so it passed a sweeping civil rights bill that guaranteed full and equal enjoyment of public accommodations, like inns, theaters, uh, public transit, uh, without regard to race or color. So together, these acts represented the most significant effort on the part of the federal government to secure the civil rights of citizens uh, at any point in our country's history up until the 1960s. And at first, with the support of President Grant and the Republican Congress, the project achieved some measure measurable success in achieving equality. But the program ult ultimately ended in failure, due in no small part to a series of decisions by the Supreme Court. Now, what accounted for that failure? Well, all of the acts I just mentioned were grounded on the notion that the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments uh, had greatly expanded the set of national citizenship rights, rights that citizens enjoy by virtue of their status as citizens of the United States and which are therefore beyond the power of states to abridge. Congress viewed the three amendments as having granted the federal government vastly expanded power at the state's expense to enforce these new rights of national citizenship. But the Supreme Court of course, took a different view, both as to the scope of the rights conferred by the Reconstruction Era amendments and the extent of Congress's power to enforce those rights. And I'll just run through uh, real briefly some of the, the more significant Supreme Court cases that came down during that era. Uh, probably the first and most significant of those cases uh, were the Slaughterhouse cases, uh, decided in 1873. And together with United States versus Cruikshank in 1876, uh, the court there ruled that the rights of national citizenship protected, by, protected against state infringement by the 14th Amendment were extremely narrow. They consisted only of things like the right to use the navigable waters of the United States, uh, the right to, to demand the protection of the federal government while, while on the high seas, the right to free access to the United States uh, seaports. Very narrow conception of, of the rights of national citizenship. Most of the really fundamental rights, the rights people would really care about, the court held, were incidents of state citizenship left solely to the domain of the states to protect. In Cruikshank in the United States versus Harris, decided in 1883, and several later decisions, the court held that the 14th and 15th Amendments couldn't be used to reach the actions of private individuals, only state actors. That left Congress powerless to prevent private individuals from interfering with the rights conferred by, the, by those two amendments. Even though much of the violence and intimidation designed to deter African Americans from exercising their rights was perpetrated by private, not state actors. Now the court did hold, just as a side note, the court did hold elsewhere that Congress has the power to punish private individuals who interfere with the right to vote in federal elections, but not because that right was conferred by the 15th Amendment. As I said, that, that amendment was uh, construed to be limited only to state action. Um, but that right, uh, uh, the, but that power rather, was implied uh, from Article I of, uh, of the Constitution, which obviously uh, created, created Congress and um, granted the right to vote. The, the other significant case, and really the last of the, uh, the significant cases that narrowed the, the scope of Congress's power, um, were the civil rights cases, again decided in 1883. And there, the court struck down the key public accommodations provisions that I mentioned, which were contained in the Civil Rights Act of 1875. The court held that those provisions couldn't be applied to private actors. Obviously, most of the people who would be running public inns, um, theaters, and uh, public transit uh, agencies uh, 
Those provisions couldn't be applied to private actors under Congress's 14th Amendment powers because no state action was involved. And it held the provisions couldn't be sustained under Congress's 13th Amendment powers either. That amendment, of course, authorizes Congress to, uh, to regulate purely private conduct, but the court read the extent of Congress's power narrowly as limited to prohibiting conduct that actually amounted to placing someone back in slavery or in involuntary servitude. Denying someone access to public accommodations on the basis of race, the courts, on the basis of race, the court held, the court ruled, didn't rise to that level. Now, Justice Harlan, who is rightly famous for his dissent in uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, a number of years later, uh, wrote a dissent in this case, uh, which I think is on a par uh, with his Plessy dissent. And in it, he argued persuasively that the Thirteenth Amendment did not just abolish slavery; it, it also authorized Congress, as he put it to protect the freedom established, and consequently to secure the enjoyment of such civil rights as were fundamental in freedom. <clears throat> now, after this series of decisions, and no doubt fueled as well by the contemporaneous withdrawal of federal troops from the South and the shift in public opinion against Reconstruction, the executive branch largely gave up on trying to enforce the civil rights statutes that Congress had enacted. And in 1894, after the Democrats regained control of Congress in the White House, Congress actually repealed many of the remaining civil rights provisions that the Supreme Court had left standing. There was thus a, thus a long period of dormancy in federal civil rights enforcement, during which the threat of violence at the hands of uh, both the police and private indiv individuals became an entrenched part of daily life for African Americans in the South. That's where things stood basically until the late 1930s. So we've got a period really stretching from the 1870s to the 1880s all the way to the 1930s when the federal government was really not a player at all in civil rights enforcement, or at least uh, in a very marginal way. But things began to change in 1939 when the newly appointed Attorney General, Frank Murphy, he was later Associate Justice Murphy on the Supreme Court, when Frank Murphy created the Civil Rights Section within the Criminal Division of the Department of Justice. In, 19, in 1957, that section was elevated to full divisional status, and today it's, it's called the Civil Rights Division. Without that development, it's doubtful the Screws case would ever have been brought, much less reach the Supreme Court. So I'm going to spend a couple of minutes uh, discussing the, the section's early years and how the Screws case fit into the section's broader litigation strategy. Attorney General Murphy formed the Civil Rights Section for the express purpose of reinvigorating the federal government's role in civil rights enforcement. At the time, Americans were watching fascism's rise in Europe with alarm, and that prompted some uh, here at home to focus more closely on uh, respect for civil liberties. Murphy said he created the section because he wanted to send a warning that the full might of the federal government would be brought to bear to protect the civil rights of oppressed minority groups in the United States. One of the first tasks that the new section confronted, though, was figuring out which statutory tools remained at its disposal, given the, the past course of Supreme Court decisions I mentioned. So Murphy directed lawyers assigned to the section to undertake a comprehensive study of the existing statutes the federal government could use to prosecute civil rights violations. That study revealed that there were really just three statutes left uh, of, of, any, of any real significance. And, uh, and one of those uh, statutes, the Anti-Peonage Act of 1867, is of, is of relatively limited use since it only applies to cases involving peonage, which is a form of involuntary servitude. The other two statutes that were still on the books and, uh, and were left standing uh, did seem more promising, though. Uh, and, but, but both did have apparent limitations. The first is the statute now codified at 18 U.S.C. Section 241, so a statutory cousin uh, of sorts of Section 242. Um, and that, that statute began its life at Section 6 of the Enforcement Act of 1870. That statute simplified somewhat, uh, prohibits two or more persons from conspiring to prevent someone from exercising their federal constitutional rights. The good news was that the statute had been held to apply to private individuals and public officials alike. The bad news was that because the statute applied to private individuals, it had been construed 
beginning with the Supreme Court's decision in that Cruikshank uh, uh, case that I mentioned earlier, it had been construed as limited to interference with rights arising from the relationship between the victim and the federal government. <clears throat> it therefore did not cover any rights, such as those conferred by the 14th and 15th Amendments, that the Constitution protects only against interference by state actors. As a result, the statute had, been, had mainly been used up until then to prosecute conspiracies aimed at interfering with the right to vote in a federal election. The other statute, of course, was Section 242. And unlike Section 241, which had been subject to fairly extensive judicial interpretation uh, since its enactment, there were almost no cases interpreting Section 242. It had been the subject of only two reported decisions, both at the trial level, one involving the prosecution of a school official for excluding students on the basis of race, the other involving interference with voting rights. Now, the only thing that seemed clear about the statute's scope, and again, I'm, I'm now focusing on Section 242, the only thing that seemed clear about the statute's scope was that it was limited to prosecutions against public officials by virtue of the statute's requirement that the, de that the defendant have acted under color of law. And that obviously is a key phrase that I'll, I'll come back to in a minute. But in terms of the, the actual constitutional rights the statute could be used to enforce, no one was quite sure what to think. <clears throat> The civil rights section lawyers hoped that because Section 242 was limited to public officials, it could be used to prosecute violations of a much broader set of rights than Section 241, including the full range of constitutional rights the Supreme Court had begun incorporating against the states by way of the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause. And you'll recall that in that time frame, uh, that, that process was just getting underway. <clears throat> Besides uncertainty over the scope of the rights protected, Two additional issues of statutory interpretation remain unresolved with respect to Section 242. First, unlike Section 241, Section 242 required that the defendant have acted willfully. That mens rea requirement was not present in Section 241. Uh, that men mens rea requirement had been added to the statute during a 1909 recodification, but without any legislative history to shed light on what it, what it was supposed to mean. And second, it wasn't, wasn't entirely clear what the phrase under color of law meant. Some past decisions had suggested that it meant merely that the defendant had to be acting under the pretense of state or local law, <clears throat> even if the defendant had acted in violation of that law. The court appeared to have taken that approach in 1941 in United States versus Classic, uh, but that case involved a prosecution under both sections 241 and 242, and most of the court's analysis in that case focused on Section 241. So, given all of the uncertainty surrounding the scope of Section 242, civil rights section lawyers began looking for test cases they could take to the Supreme Court to obtain a definitive construction of the statute. The Screws case seemed like an ideal, uh, like an ideal one from the government standpoint, and not just because the, the facts were obviously compelling. The case would force the Supreme Court to decide whether Section 242 could be used in cases involving police brutality, which had been the subject of a large number of the complaints flooding the section each year since it was established. And the court, for the first time, would have to decide whether Section 242 could be used to prosecute violations of rights protected by the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause. I think, as I mentioned, the prosecution's theory in the Screws case was that uh, the victim, Robert Hall, had been deprived of uh, his due process rights in the sense that the, the officers deprived him of the right to receive a trial on the charge for which he had been arrested. <clears throat> okay, that brings us to the opinions and screws. And let me talk a little bit about them. <clears throat> well, uh, well let, me, let me just put it in these terms. The, the, court, uh, the court did issue its decision in screws uh, about eight months after it heard argument, but it was, it was badly splintered. Um, and in fact, the court barely produced an enforceable judgment at all. Justice Douglas was the author of the lead opinion, but he spoke only for himself and three other justices, Chief Justice Stone and Justices Black and Reed. Douglas's opinion tackled two main issues. The first was what amounted to uh, basically a facial challenge raised by the defendants to the statute's constitutionality on the ground that when it was applied to rights protected by the Due Process Clause, the statute was too vague to be the basis for criminal liability. And the second issue was what the statutory phrase under color of law meant. Let's start with the under, under color, color of law issue. 
The defendants in Screws argued that they could not have been acting under color of Georgia law because to convict, the jury had necessarily found that they deliberately killed Hall without justification. And that conduct, which was murder, plainly violated Georgia law. So the defendants argued that Section 242 was intended to apply only when the defendants' actions were taken in compliance with state law, since only then could their acts be deemed those of the state. Douglas definitively rejected that construction of the statute. He reasoned that under color of law could not mean simply under law. The phrase color of must have some meaning. It was enough, Douglas concluded, that the officers had acted under pretense of law, that they had acted in their official capacities um, as law enforcement officers when they arrested Hall pursuant to an arrest warrant, however dubious the, the validity of that warrant might have been. The fact that they had misused the authority granted to them by state law could not render them immune to punishment from the federal government. If it did, Douglas noted, states would have an easy way to avoid the commands of the federal constitution. Now, resolving the vagueness challenge proved somewhat more difficult. The argument from the defendant's standpoint wasn't a bad one. They argued, in effect, the following. How can we be convicted for violating someone's due process rights when Section 242 doesn't spell out what those rights are? And the standard the court had articulated at that point for defining rights protected by the, by the due process clause was something as vague as a principle of justice so rooted in the traditions and conscience of our people as to be ranked as fundamental. Recall that, the, again, that the Supreme Court had just recently begun the process of incorporating various provisions of the Bill of Rights against the states by way of the 14th Amendment's due process clause, and in, in effect, slowly reversing its earlier narrow construction of the rights inherent in national citizenship. Whether that process would extend to all provisions of the Bill of Rights, or just some, was very much still in a state of flux. And how far that process would extend to other unenumerated rights was also still very much in flux. <clears throat> Even when specific rights have been held applicable against the states, the defendants argued, it was still impossible to know in advance what conduct would constitute a violation of those rights. The defendants pointed, for example, to the court's own difficulty, often by closely divided votes, in deciding under what circumstances a state, court's de a state court defendant's right to counsel is triggered. So imagine a state court judge whose decision to deny counsel to an indigent defendant was later reversed by the Supreme Court. Could the judge be prosecuted for having willfully deprived the defendant of his right to due process? Or what about police officers interrogating a suspect? How were they supposed to know whether their conduct would later be deemed to render the suspect's confession involuntary when the Supreme Court's own standard for testing the voluntariness of confessions under the due, under the due process clause kept evolving? The concerns raised by the defendants in Screws were certainly legitimate but they related more to concepts of fair notice. Uh, those, and those, those concerns, the concerns they raised, could have been addressed by requiring the due process right in question to have been established with sufficient clarity and specificity at the time the defendants acted. That's essentially what the court ended up doing decades later to address fair notice concerns in the civil context by developing the doctrine of qualified immunity. And ironically, it's the mode of analysis Justice Douglas used a few years later to uphold a conviction under Section 242 of a defendant who brutally beat confessions out of uh, suspects. But in Screws, Justice Douglas took a different tack in addressing the vagueness problem under Section 242. He latched onto the statute's requirement that the defendant have acted willfully in depriving someone of their constitutional rights. He concluded that the vagueness problem was solved if the court interpreted willfully to mean that the defendant had to act with the specific intent to deprive the victim of her constitutional rights. If the government proved that, Douglas reasoned, then the defendant must have had fair notice that his conduct violated the statute. After all, you can't, uh, you can't specifically intend to deprive someone of a constitutional right if you weren't aware of the right's existence. After deciding that Section 242 required the government to prove this, this new version of specific intent, Justice Douglas held that the defendant's convictions had to be vacated. The jury, not surprisingly, hadn't been instructed on that newly announced element of the offense, so the case had to be remanded for a retrial. <clears throat> 
Justices Rutledge and Murphy would have affirmed the convictions. They each wrote separate, quite powerful opinions explaining why they agreed with Justice Douglas on the under color of law issue, but vigorously disagreed that any vagueness issue was present in this case. Whatever concerns might be raised on that front in other cases, they argued, the defendants in this case could not complain that the due process right they were charged with violating was too vague. As Justice Murphy put it, knowledge of a comprehensive law library is unnecessary for officers of the law to know that the right to murder individuals in the course of their duties is unrecognized in this nation. Sticking to his convictions, Justice Murphy, he, he dissented. He dissented outright. But Justice Rutledge agreed somewhat reluctantly to go along with the plurality's disposition of the case, which was remanding for a new trial, just to ensure that the court could reach a judgment. That's the only way that you could get to five justices. The three remaining justices, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the three remaining justices, Roberts, Frankfurter, and Jackson, dissented and would have reversed the convictions outright. They went completely in the opposite direction. They issued a joint dissent, uh, which has become a little bit more common these days, was, was not uh, common by any means then, um, although it's widely believed that Justice Frankfurter was the lead author of it. The Frankfurter dissent took strong issue with both of the plurality's holdings. Frankfurter mocked Justice, Justice Douglas's solution to the vagueness problem, pointing out that the defect in the statute, at least as applied to due process rights, was that the specific rights Congress intended to be covered were not enumerated in the statute itself. The problem, therefore, was not one, was that no one could know beforehand whether his acts would or would not trigger the statute. Requiring a, requiring a defendant to act willfully did not solve that problem. But it was with the under color of law issue that Justice Frankfurter uh, took strongest issue. In his view, the court's construction of Section 242 had instituted a revolutionary change in the balance of power between the national government and the states. He argued that because the defendants violated Georgia law by committing murder, this was a purely local crime enforcement matter that had always been left to the domain of the states. The federal government was now going to be allowed to make, as Frankfurter put it, every lawless act of the policeman on the beat a federal crime. To avoid that outcome, Frankfurter, Frankfurter would have read Section 242 as applying only when the defendant's actions were authorized by state law. Only then, he contended, would the federal government have a legitimate interest in intervening. That gives you a picture of at least what the various opinions in the Screws case um, said. Now I want to turn to the legacy of Screws. The conventional thinking has been that Screws' legacy is at best a mixed one because the court unnecessarily complicated the prosecution of civil rights violations under Section 242 by imposing that new specific re intent requirement that I, I mentioned earlier. There's certainly some validity, validity to that view uh, the court required proof that the defendant act with a purpose to deprive a person of a specific constitutional right. That's the phrasing the court used in, in Screws. But the court then added that the defendant need not be thinking in constitutional terms to be guilty. So it's never been entirely clear how the government is supposed to go about proving this element, element of the offense. And judges and, and lawyers in Section 242 cases have struggled to formulate comprehensible jury instructions explaining it. The one thing everyone agrees on, though, is that the specific intent requirement imposed by Screws has made it harder for the government to win convictions, even in cases where the defendants obviously acted in bad faith. It's worth noting that on remand in the Screws case itself, a case that seems about as straightforward as they come in terms of proving bad faith on the part of the defendants, all three defendants were, were acquitted when retried. In fact, Screws actually emerged from the case uh, maybe better off for it because he was later elected to the Georgia State Senate. So he didn't suffer any, any major negative consequences from his involvement in that, in that case. Now, we don't know whether the instruction the second jury received on, uh, on specific intent necessarily made the difference. Uh, but one of the prosecutors who tried the case said afterward that the jury instruction the trial court gave, uh, which was faithful to the Screws holding, um, uh, the jury instruction the trial court gave on, on the specific intent element was very damaging for the government's case. 
And uh, one uh, maybe somewhat humorous side note on this point, during the court's internal deliberations in Screws, uh, Justice Jackson, one of the dissenters, uh, circulated a memo to his colleagues criticizing Justice Douglas's draft opinion on a number of fronts. And with respect to the specific intent requirement that Douglas had proposed as a means uh, of saving the statute from, uh, from unconstitutionality, Jackson said, it makes, it, makes more, it makes more prosecutions possible and fewer convictions probable about the most mischievous thing I can imagine. Uh, and well, it, it, as we know, as a predictive matter, he, he turned out to be right on that point. So there was uh, perhaps some justification for those who, in the immediate aftermath of Screws, viewed it at, largely as a defeat for the cause of civil rights enforcement. But viewing the decision with the benefit of almost 70 years of hindsight, I think a different and far more positive picture emerges. The most important legacy of Screws is that Section 242 survived. And that had importance uh, both in terms of its direct impact on police brutality cases like Screws and its more indirect effect on the broader social changes that occurred in the decades that followed. Let me start with the, uh, the in terms of, uh, of Screws' most immediate effect. Um, the survival of Section 242 meant that the federal government would have a role to play in combating the widespread problem of police brutality toward African Americans and other minorities, particularly in the South. Had the statute instead been struck down, the power of the federal government to prosecute such abuses would have been drastically curtailed. No other statute remained that would have allowed the federal government to prosecute violations of the most basic rights under the 14th Amendment. The facts of the Screws case I think, illustrate why preservation of a federal role for civil rights enforcement in this area was so important. What's most striking about the officers' actions in Screws is how little concern they had for ever being punished for what they did. They seized a man out of the comfort and supposed security of his home on fabricated charges of wrongdoing and then proceeded to beat him to death in plain view in, plain view in the middle of the town square. They made no effort to hide their actions and apparently didn't care who saw or heard what they were doing. They did so because they had no fear that the state would ever prosecute them for killing an African American. And they were right. The state of Georgia did refuse to prosecute them. The only way that mindset changed was through the inter intervention by the federal government. And if the Supreme Court had denied the federal government that power and screws, the progress we've seen on this front would have been much more what would have been much slower in coming. I think it's easy to discount the effect that federal prosecutions like the one in Screws had on changing, however slowly, the mindset of police officers in the South. It's not. It's, it's obviously not as though once the Screws decision came down, police brutality ceased to be a major problem. The federal government back then brought relatively few Section 242 prosecutions, and that's still true today. And convictions in such cases were back then, uh, as they are still today, notoriously difficult to obtain. But in the aftermath of screws, lawyers in the civil rights section noted that even when Section 242 prosecutions in the South did not result in convictions, they still had a noticeable deterrent effect on the local police forces involved. That stands to reason since officers who previously could have acted with all but certain impunity now had to factor in at least the possibility that they might wind up in federal prison. The decision in Screws also helped breathe life into another tool that has been used to combat police brutality and other forms of police misconduct, a civil suit under the statute that's now codified at 42 U.S.C. Section 1983. That statute, too, traces its lineage back to the Reconstruction Era civil rights statutes that Congress enacted. But it was sparingly used until the Supreme Court decided Monroe v. Pape in 1961. In that case, the court was again confronted with the meaning of the phrase under color of, uh, which is found in Section 1983 as well. Relying on its decision in screws, the court gave that phrase the same construction under Section 1983 that it had under Section 242. Justice Frankfurter again dissented, raising the same federalism objections he had voiced in screws, but this time he was alone. Section 242 has been used to prosecute police misconduct in many different settings over the years, and, and not just in the South. Two high-profile cases immediately come to mind. The federal government used Section 242 to prosecute some of the men 
uh, responsible for the 1964 murders of three young civil rights activists, James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner, outside Philadelphia, Mississippi, in the case that uh, later for formed the basis for the movie Mississippi Burning. <clears throat> Federal prosecutors ultimately charged 18 defendants after local authorities refused to bring charges under state law in that case, and seven of the 18 were convicted. And of course, more recently, uh, maybe more familiar, familiar to the younger folks uh, in the room like myself, um, Section 242 was used to prosecute four of the officers involved in the Rodney King beating in 1991 after a state court jury acquitted them. Two of the officers, officers were convicted in the federal trial. Section 242 has also been used to prosecute a wide variety of civil rights violations outside the police brutality context. The statute has been invoked against abusive prison guards, sexually harassing police officers, a state judge who sexually assaulted female litigants and court uh, officers, and corrupt public officials. Without Section 242 um, having sort of remained intact following screws, the victims in such cases might never see their constitutional rights vindicated. Finally, to conclude, let me comment briefly on what I think are some of the broader ind indirect effects the Screws case had on civil rights enforcement. Screws provided an emphatic rejection of the narrow view of federal authority to protect civil rights that had led the Supreme Court to strike down many of the Reconstruction era statutes that I discussed earlier. The result of the Supreme Court's approach during that era was a perpetuation of the status quo for African Americans in the South. Had Justice Frankfurter's conception of federal authority prevailed in screws, the, the Supreme Court would have again validated the notion that the 14th Amendment did not fundamentally alter, alter the balance of power between the national government and the states. Instead, the court upheld the federal government's power to regulate in one of the most sensitive areas of a state's internal affairs, the conduct of its police force. If there were any area where the court could have been expected to say that Congress had gone too far in the name of protecting civil rights, it was this one. But the court turned back the vigorous arguments advanced by Justice Frankfurter, by Justice Frankfurter that Section 242 intruded too heavily on states' rights. And in the process, the court made clear that the federal government could play a significant role in forcing states to change practices that seriously disadvantage minorities. As we know, federal intervention on multiple fronts proved essential to ending the climate of fear and discrimination in which African Americans and other minorities in the South were forced to live until recently. The decision in Screws didn't spark those developments. Broader political and social forces had to mobilize to make that happen. But I think it's fair to say that Screws removed one potential barrier to further federal intervention in the South. The case marks one instance, at least, in which the court refused to leave the business of civil rights to the states alone, as Justice Frankfurter had urged. In that way, screws may have created some momentum for the even more drastic federal interventions that were necessary to bring about fundamental social change in the 1950s and 1960s. And I think it's, it really is that legacy for which the case uh, deserves our appreciation today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judge Watford. We have time for some questions, so we usually do this with a show of hands, and then I will call on someone. Um, yes, Professor Secunda. Please, go ahead. Thank you, Judge Watford. I really appreciated your, your comments. I thought it was really interesting. Um, I was curious, um, around the same time, the court also decided the case of Korematsu. Um, have you given any thought to the relationship between Screws and Korematsu as far as civil rights during this period of the uh, court's uh, history? You know, I have not. Um, I have not given any thought. Um, and, and I don't know what, what connections one might draw. Uh, you're right that they were decided quite closely in time, um, sort of in the same, same era uh, with World War II uh, raging. Um, but no, I, in, all, in all honesty, I have not given any thought to that. It's a very interesting question, though. Other questions? Mr. Okay, Jay, go ahead. Professor Ranny. 
it seems something of a miracle, doesn't it, that uh, they, they obtained convictions uh, initially. Um, no, I, you know, all, all we have from the record are the, the speculation from the, the prosecutors as to, well, why did we lose the second time? Um, obviously, the thing that was different was that there was this new jury instruction that was given. Um, but uh, no, there's no, there's no suggestion as to what was so special about uh, what happened in the first trial. I guess the thing, though, that I will say, um, just looking at the uh, at the record in the case, we have basically the full trial transcript. And what's I think is remarkable remarkable about what happened in Screws um, was that I mean there there were probably a dozen or so witnesses who these townsfolk who, as I said, lived right around the town square. Most of them were white, and most of them knew Screws for 20, 25 years, and yet they were willing to come into court and testify against him. Um, you know, I, I guess the, the, the one difference besides the jury instruction that I did see some reference made to was the fact that during the first trial, it, it, the first trial occurred within maybe seven or eight months of Robert Hall's death. By the time the case went back for a retrial, it was, you know, three years later. And so the case was deemed somewhat stale at that point. I don't know if they weren't able to perhaps find all of the same witnesses who testified in the first trial. Um, but I think you know, a lot of people looking back would say, Boy, it was it was kind of a miracle that uh, that the officers got convicted the first time, and and of course one of the problems the the civil rights section had in finding these test cases that they could take up to the Supreme Court was that you had to have a lot of things fall into place for for a case actually to be right for the Supreme Court to review it. First off, you had to find you had to get a, a, usually an all white grand jury willing to even indict the officers. That was the first thing. Um, and then you needed to get a conviction so that there could be an appeal, because if there were an acquittal, obviously that's the end of the case. Other questions or observations? Yes, please. Uh, Art. The anti-lynching campaign of the NAACP and others in the development both in the Department of Justice and in the court's uh, view of these matters. Well, uh, do you mean in terms of uh, as, as motivating factors for the formation of the civil rights section? Well, and also, yeah, and, and their, the pressure to do something once they were prosecuted and the court's reception to those. Yes, well, um, I, you know, I, the, the references I've seen in the literature to what motivated Justice Murphy to create the civil rights section at the time that he did, um, I, I have to believe, uh, you know, he, he was aware, I mean, he was a passionate defender of, of civil rights, and he must have been aware, certainly, of, of the abuses that were occurring. But I think the, the, the statements I've seen attributed to him um, in terms of explaining his actions, they really were tied to the, the climate of the time and what was going on overseas, and just a, a recognition that, uh, you know, what makes our society special is that we're different from, uh, from these other more totalitarian regimes. And um, how can we hold ourselves out as different? Um, how can we even, um, uh, you know, um, sort of uh, speak with any moral force against what's happening in Europe if here at home uh, our, our own house is in such disarray. So I, I have no doubt that uh, uh, those uh, abuses that you mentioned that uh, were very notorious at the time um, had to factor into this, uh, to the decision. But it, it seems like it really was something uh, that uh, Attorney General Murphy himself drove. Um, I don't know if if he, you know, if someone else had been appointed at that particular time, I'm not sure that the civil rights section would have been uh, would have necessarily been formed then. I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Yes, Mr. Donahue, I thought I sensed a question coming from you a moment ago. <laughs> Former state prosecutor, current state prosecutor. Was there any attempt? considering this was the end of the Second World War, to, quote, fix it in Congress? Was there any talk of that? Or I mean, usually that doesn't happen, but back then, especially the end of the Second World War. Yeah, no, there, there certainly was not. And I think um, 
what the civil rights section, uh, I mentioned that there was this uh, attempt to say, okay, well, let, let's sort of survey the, the landscape to see what we've got left, because at the time, the feeling was there was really no likelihood that at least Congress at that point was going to enact any new civil rights uh, uh, legislation, and I don't think there was any chance that the court, uh, that Congress would have fixed this statute, at least at that time, maybe a couple decades later, but at least not at that time if, in fact, um, the, the, the statute had been struck down. I think it would have been one less, you know, one less tool in the federal government's arsenal. So I hand up over here. Go ahead, John Pauly. I'm interested in if in your research uh, you had any sense of how journalists covered this or responded or, or whether that was made visible at all. We're, we're so used to, especially Supreme Court cases, having a public uh, this discussion in a different way now than maybe then. And, and I ask in part because the Screws case occurs at a period that begins about a 15 or 20 year moment of really difficult reflection among journalists, the kind of version of the Federalist argument where where northern editors uh, are constantly questioned about their right to come and cover the civil rights case and then mm -hmm. find themselves by the 1960s having to recognize that civil rights is a national issue, not just a, a regional issue. So is there, I mean, was the screw case visible? Like publicly visible in in journalism, uh, was it taken up by by Ralph McGill or any other the more liberal Southern editor? You know, I, I don't know. I did not look at um, the way it was covered in the media. That was something that um, I, I'd be very interested in studying at some point. Um, just especially kind of contemporaneous uh, accounts of the of the trial, whether the trial got any publicity outside the South, um, and especially after the Supreme Court's decision came down. But I, I honestly have not looked at that, so I can't say. Okay. Thank you very much, Judge Watford.